All right, now, um, obviously the, the Christian life, it's more than just receiving Jesus Christ for your salvation. That's where it starts. That's the beginning. There's a lot more to it than that. Now, we have a tendency to stress our salvation because it is so important. I mean, at least if you had salvation and nothing else, I mean, your soul is saved from going to hell. We stress this because it's important when we go out and give people the gospel that their souls are saved from going to hell. It, it is the most important thing, but it is not the only thing. It's not the only aspect of life. Like I said, that's just the beginning. You know, a Christian life starts after you're you know, born a Christian. You're born again. And there's a lot more to it than that, than just being born into the family. We want to make sure we're good children. We want to make sure we're doing what's pleasing to the Father. And um, I want to say this morning, it's even more than just keeping yourself from sin. Because that's also an important aspect. You know, you're born again. You say, you know, I want to please God. So I'm going to read the Bible. And he tells me not to do this and this and this. So I'm going to obey him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do what's right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid all of these sins and get the sin out of my life. Yes, do that. But that's not where it stops either. What I want to be preaching about, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning goes beyond even that. And it goes to us serving God with our life and actually being proactive about it. Taking the steps and saying, it's one, because when you don't sin, all you're doing is not doing things. Right? When you're saying, well, God said not to steal, so I'm not going to steal. You're not actually doing something. You're just keeping yourself from doing something, right? You're keeping yourself from sin. You're keeping yourself from, from getting into trouble in that way. But I want to preach about us actually doing, actually being in examples, being um, leaders, being, you know, some people that other people can look to and say, that person's a Christian and I can tell that person's a Christian. Not only are they keeping themselves from a lot of things that, that everybody else is doing, but they're also doing work. They're also accomplishing something for God. They're, they're, they're using the life that they have, the, the precious few moments we have on this earth, to actually build something and do something for God and, and, and to be proactive about it. Now, I want to look at this example of the Thessalonians we're starting off with. And I love the introductory letter, that the, the chapter here that, that Paul is writing to this church in Thessalonica. Because these were good people. These were people that didn't, you know, and the, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. You read First and Second Corinthians, and, and you see a lot of problems and Paul's addressing a lot of issues and sins and, and they have this wrong and that wrong and, you know, and, and, and different epistles are written differently. The Thessalonians are, are, are starting off right off the bat are being pretty good. And um, let's look down at verse number three where we started reading. The Bible says, or look at verse number two actually, we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. So Paul's writing to them and saying, you know, we don't forget you in our prayers. We're praying for you. We're keeping you in our hearts, in our minds, in our prayers. And he says, we remember your working, working of faith without ceasing. We remember the labor of love that you, that you are actually doing, that you're committed to doing, your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Verse number four, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now, this church in Thessalonica, they didn't get that way just by chance to be workers and working at the labor of love. And, and, and Paul's really given them a lot of honor here by, by speaking so well to them and um, saying how he's remembering a prayer. But the reason why they even got to that point to begin with is because they had good leaders to follow. They had good examples themselves to pattern themselves off of. So he said, and he starts off saying in verse 5 there, where we just read, he says, as you know, in the latter part of that verse, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So Paul's saying the way that we behaved ourselves, the way that we presented ourselves, the, all the work that we did 
It was for your sake. You know what type of people we were, and that was for your sake. So you can see what type of people we are, so you could learn from us. Verse number six, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord. And um, I really want to make this distinction this morning um, because a lot of people these days will say, you know, I don't need to follow some man. A lot of people will say, I don't go to church because I don't need some man to tell me what the Bible says. And that's their big complaint. They say, well, who is the pastor anyways? What does he know? I could learn all this stuff on my own. I don't need to go to church. And it's a bad attitude to have. We're going to see, I'm going to give you many examples, and I'm going to get more into that point a little bit later, but I'm going to give you a lot of examples. I just wanted to, to mention it now and keep that in mind and look at how often we're going to see people being followers of other men. In verse number six here, he says, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord. And the key is, you know, the, the person you want to follow is someone who is already following the Lord. So if they're following the Lord, then you don't have a problem with following that man, that person, you know, that example that you have that you can see and, and learn from and everything else. Now, if they're not following the Lord, obviously that's not the person that you want to be following. But we all need leaders. We're, they, they, as human beings, we're designed to just, you know, there, there are leaders and there's, there's most people follow. And that's just kind of the way it is. And, but we also, you know, I'm not saying not to try to be a leader. Being a leader is great. But we also need to know how to follow. We also need to be able to, to, be able to learn from other people because you're not a leader just overnight. You have to learn from someone else. And there's a lot that you can learn from other people. And, um, and we need to keep that in our minds. But let's keep reading here. He says in verse 6, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost. And again, this is, he's saying, you know, you received the word even though there was a lot of troubles and a lot of affliction, and, you know, maybe people persecuting him and, and especially people persecuting the Apostle Paul, yet they still chose to listen to him. And he says, you still became followers of us even in troublous times, even though things are hard. Verse number seven, so that ye, now he's saying that you all, right, that's what ye is, that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. And that is a great compliment to say, you know what? Because of what you're doing, because of you are such good examples, because of the work that you're doing, people are hearing about this. People are talking about, people already know about your faith to God. How are they going to know about your faith to God if you just have your faith and you sit at home and you read your Bible and you study and that's all you do? No one's going to know about that. No one's going to know about your faith in God. The only way they're going to know about your faith in God is if you are doing more than just that. They're not just necessarily going to know about your faith in God because you, you, you keep to yourself and you say, well, I'm not sinning. I'm keeping a pure life. You need to be proactive in doing more in order for people to even take notice of that. In order for people to understand and, and to talk about it to the point to where you were examples. That's what samples means to all them that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. They, they heard about you. They hear about your faith. They hear about your great works. They hear about the great things that you're doing to serve the Lord. And he says, in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad. So Paul's saying, like, I don't even have to bring up the church in Thessalonica and say how great of a job you guys are doing because everyone already knows about it. And this is what we want to strive to be, those types of examples, those types of believers where, yes, we're getting the sin out, right? We're, I mean, we're saved, we're born again, but we're doing more. We're putting our efforts in places and, it, and it's becoming obvious to people that we are doing this work and, and, and trying to get people saved and trying to, to just, just bring about the truth. I mean, preach the truth to people and try to get people on board, get excited about church, get excited about meeting people, get excited about talking to people and, and, and bringing salvation through the Word of God. Verse number 9 says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter 4, the first book in the New Testament. 
We saw here in 1 Thessalonians that they became followers of us, meaning Paul and the, and the other apostles that were, that were teaching them and of the Lord. And one thing I want to point out here, we're going to see in Matthew chapter 4, is that if you are following the Lord, He will make you a soul winner. And we're going to see that from Scripture. If, if you are truly following the Lord, He will make you into a soul winner. Matthew chapter 4, look at verse number 18 of Matthew chapter number 4. We're going to see Jesus here. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. So, this is when Jesus is just starting off his ministry. He comes across Peter and Andrew, his brother. You know, they're fishermen, they're doing their job. And, he's, and he comes across and says, hey, follow me. And what do they do? They drop, their, they drop what they're doing. They drop their life as it is, the life as they know it. They're fishermen. I mean, they're at work. They're saying, no, but I'm a, I'm a fisherman. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. I'm a fisherman. Jesus said to them, follow me. And when he called, they said, okay, we're done. And, and they, they were able to just like that drop everything and follow the Lord. What great faith. Hey, God's calling all of us to do different things with our life. Be sure of that. Be sure of that. We need to be listening to him and be ready to just say, hey, even if it doesn't fit into your plans, Say, oh, that's not what I was intending on doing with my life. I was planning on doing this. I'm planning on doing that. If God's calling you to do His work or to do something for Him, you ought to listen to Him. And He'll, I mean, you will be extremely blessed by doing that. I'm not, that's not even what the sermon's about, getting into all the blessings that you can receive from that. But we ought to have that type of faith. But what I want to point out here as well is that He said to them, He said, follow me. He didn't just say follow me. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So you were fishermen in, in the sense that you were going out and catching literal fish in the sea to eat and to sell and, and to earn your living by. He says, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. You will be going out literally and catching men and converting men unto God. And that is what our job is. We are to be fishers of men. Now, if you are not a fisher of men, if you are not going out and getting people converted and preaching the gospel and doing these things and bringing people to Christ, can you really say that you're following Jesus? Because Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. He will do it. So what, I, what, I, what, what you need to consider today is think about this too. If you are not a fisher of men, if you are not able to, you know, like, you know, spreading the truth and, tr and, and trying to get, win people to Christ and, 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 and doing that type of effort, then you are not following Jesus. You know, no one wants to think they're not following Jesus. You don't. But we need to look at ourselves and look at our own lives. Hey, and hopefully everyone is doing that. I mean, we're, we're, we're tempting to, to, to talk about Christ and, and to bring people to the truth. But if you're not, the Bible says you're not following Jesus. But if you are following Jesus, he will make you an fisher of men. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter number 8. You're in Matthew, so the next book over is Mark. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 8. Because we also have to remember, if, if, if we follow Christ... And he's going to make us into a fisher of men that doesn't come without a cost. Obviously, there was a cost to Simon, Peter, and Andrew because they gave up their jobs. I mean, they gave up their, their livelihood and their income and just, just, they left it. There's a cost in that. There's a cost to serve Christ. See, we, we, we live in a society today, too, where especially people want to be able to, to have it all, Right? I want to be able to do everything that I'm doing here and I want to be able to, to serve Christ and do all this stuff. But the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon for one. So you can't just, you can't be focused on making money and doing all that and be serving God at the same time. You, you know, either you're going to love the one and hate the other or you're going to cleave to the one and despise the other. That's what the Bible says. That you, you can't be doing both. 
you know, we need to be able to put God first and say, you know what, the money, the, the, the titles or whatever positions, power, whatever it is that you're looking for in this life, none of that really matters anyways. I'm going to serve Christ. And um, if you're in Mark chapter 8, look at verse number 34. Jesus tells us here that there is a cost to serving him. Mark 8.34 says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. So he's, I mean, he's, he's telling them, look, you've got to take up your cross. If you want to be a follower of Jesus. You want to follow Christ, well that's how he's going to make you a fisher of men, but if you're going to follow him, you got to take up your cross. You have to deny yourself, those other plans, those other things, being a fisherman, you know, building a business, whatever, you know, you have to be able to just say, I'm just going to serve Jesus. I'm going to do what he wants me to do, and however that works out, it works out. Um, but you need to be willing to be able to, to give him all um, based on what he's calling you to do. And, and not to be so stuck on, on your own stuff, but being able to um, give, pay that price in order to follow him. Now, um, and this isn't, this isn't just for pastors. Not all of the apostles were pastors, too. Just remember that. You know, Peter was a pastor. John was a pastor. They were elders. The Bible refers to them. You can see that from Scripture. But it doesn't record every single one of them becoming a pastor of a church. So. Don't just think that like, oh yeah, of course they were. But how do you know what God's calling you to do? How do you know that? Right? I mean, you say, well, I can't be a pastor because, you know, because I'm a woman or because I've been divorced or because I don't fit all the criteria to be a pastor. Okay, it doesn't mean God's still not calling you to serve Him. God's calling all of us to serve Him. It's just in different capacities. There's different capacities that we can serve God, but He still wants you to have the same attitude. He still wants you to be able to say, okay, I'm going to take up my cross daily and follow him. I'm going to be willing to pay the price of whatever that may be. And again, I'm not saying it's exactly the same for every single person, right? But I'm willing to do whatever it is that I need to do in order to fulfill my role that God has laid out for me, the plan that he has for my life. Now, turn, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter number four. So after the four Gospels, we got Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, and then you're going to come across Galatians and Ephesians. And Ephesians is in chapter number four, where we're reading from. Those were both examples that we just saw about follow, about Jesus literally saying to follow Him, right? Becoming a follower of Him. There's a cost. That's following Him directly. But now I'm going to switch gears again and go back to following a man. Because there is nothing inherently wrong with following a man just, just by itself. If a man's following Christ, there is no problem with following that man. And this is the very reason why God has ordained pastors and teachers of churches. There are men that, that are in a leadership position that are supposed to be examples that you're supposed to be able to follow. You should be able to follow the example of the pastor. That's why everything that we do and that I'm at, I ever ask you to do, I'm going to do myself. I would be a hypocrite to be asking you to do things if I'm not willing to do them myself. Because a lot of people will say, oh yeah, well you're the pastor, you're supposed to do all this stuff. He said, but you don't understand. I've got a job. Yes, so do I. You don't understand. I have a family. Yes, so do I. You don't understand. My wife's pregnant. Yes, so is mine. Okay. I am making time to do everything in here. You say, well, yeah, but you're the pastor. You're supposed to do that. Yes, I am supposed to do that. But I'm also showing you that you don't just have to be a full-time pastor to do all these things. If you want to do it, if you want to serve Christ, if it's in your heart, you can do it too. There's no doubt about it. I'm a busy guy, yet I still make the time to read my Bible, to pray, to memorize, to, to, to go out soul winning. I prepare sermons. I study. I do a lot of other things. I manage to do that with my time. So, 
Try not to make excuses for yourself. Look at what manner of men you have before you to be an example, the same way that the church of Thessalonica, they had the Apostle Paul. Now, I'm not saying I'm an Apostle Paul. What a great man to be able to follow. But here's, he's someone who said, you know, laboring night and day. They wor he worked as a tent maker. He says, look, we worked. We fed ourselves so that you wouldn't be burdened and so that you can see that we're hard workers and that this is what needs to be done. And if you're going to serve God, you need to be a hard worker too. You're in Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. We're going to see here because God has given us, he's instituted and ordained people to be teachers and, and pastors and these leaders. He wouldn't have ordained them if we didn't need them, if it wasn't necessary for us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? Verse 12 says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Excuse me. These are all of the things that these positions, the people in these positions are supposed to be doing. Perfecting the saints. You know, making you more complete, more perfect, more a, a better understanding, learning a lot more about God. Um, the work of the ministry, ministering unto other people, that's part of the work. That needs to be done. People need help and someone needs to be a helper. Someone needs to be going out and helping other people. That's what a lot of these roles are supposed to be fulfilling. That's why the pastor can also be called a minister because they're ministering unto people, helping other people out. Um... It says in verse number 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So well, again, he's, this is all the same thought. He's continuing on about why God has given pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets and all these different people. Part of the reason is so that we're not just children in the faith. It's so that you can learn, so that you're no longer just children that, that anytime someone comes along with a new doctrine, you just get kind of caught up in that because you don't know the Bible very well because you're not very well founded in the truth yet. And there's a lot of people that are out there just looking to deceive people. That's where the prosperity gospel is coming from. They are out looking to deceive people. Do they use the Bible? Yes, they abuse it. They use it and abuse it and try to tell you, oh, if you give $100, you'll end up getting $1,000 back. You give $1,000, you'll get $10,000. God will pour out that blessing upon you. Why are they doing it? They're lying because they want the money because they're preaching for filthy lucre's sake. But there's a lot of people out there like that and they could sure make their messages sound good. Not factual, but good. It might sound pleasing. Hey, who doesn't want to hear, oh, all I have to do is give give $100 and I'll get 1000 That appeals to that flesh. Right? Sounds like a great deal. But it's lies. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say you give $100 and God's going to give you 1000 or whatever. All these, these TV, these televangelists that are preaching this prosperity gospel. It's a bunch of lies. So we need to have good churches, good pastors, people of God who are going to be able to, to teach and to train a congregation, a flock of people. Hey, this is what the Bible really says. Don't get hoodwinked by these people. Don't fall into that trap so that you can help learn for yourself to be able to, to know the Bible for yourself and, and, and be aware and able to discern when someone's coming at you with, with this um, you know, cunning craftiness, these, these, these tricksters come in trying to, to deceive you with their false doctrine. Verse number 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Um, turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter number 3. 
it should be the next book. It's real close to Ephesians. But um, I'll read for, me, for you from 1 Corinthians 11. Um, I was going to give you some more examples of following a man because, again, I brought up earlier, a lot of people struggle with this and say, well, I don't want to follow some man. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul's admonishing him that this is the word of God. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Paul is saying, Be followers of me. How should they be followers of him? Even as I am of Christ. That is the way that we are to follow man. Hey, when someone's following Christ, you can follow that person. That's a good example when you can see you, they line up, what they're doing is lining up with Scripture. You can see that they're following Christ. Hey, you can, you can now start to learn. Because what you're doing is the Bible will teach you a lot of the things that you need to do and can tell you how to do them. But it's harder to, it's almost like reinventing the wheel if you have to figure it all out for yourself. This is one of the reasons why learning from men is important. What I mean by that is, for example, right, you can get, just by reading the Bible on your own, that we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. You can see that in Scripture. You can see the importance of it. It makes sense. You can start to look at how did they do it. Well, Jesus Christ sent people out two and two, right? You can see a couple of conversations, but not a whole lot, about actually going through the plan of salvation. This is where someone who's already been doing things for a while has already tried out different approaches, has already, you know, gone out and had a lot of experience can help you, right? This is why we do the soul winning workshop. Look, I've been out for about eight years knocking on doors and talking to people on a weekly basis. Every single week for the past eight years, I've been doing this sometimes more than once a week, you know, I mean, multiple times, whatever. I've got a lot of experience doing this and there's a lot of things that you pick up along the way. There's a lot of things that you learn. Learn that stuff from somebody. That's what a leader, that's one of the things that you can learn from a leader. I mean, obviously there's a lot of things you learn, but, but that's a good example of saying, oh, someone say, oh, I don't need some man to teach me. Well, what about someone who's been doing this for a really long time and studying their Bible for a very long time? and has had many confrontations with people who have brought up disputes and, and have brought up, you know, contradictions or whatever you want to call them or, or other faiths. Well, a lot of that I didn't know the answers to for a long time. But I had to look them up and study them so that way I can know that stuff. And, and you can all do that too, but the thing is, you get the benefit of being able to learn from someone else who's already put in a lot of work. Just like I did. Okay, I was plugged into church for, for, you know, seven years before pastoring and, and, and got really involved and, and sat under a lot of good teaching and learned everything I could possibly learn before getting to a point to where I'm able to teach other people now. And, um, you know, we see from Scripture there's nothing wrong with following someone else who's following Christ. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Paul the, delivered them ordinances. Ordinances are laws, right? They're, they're things that, parts of God's law that he wants us to follow. He's like, I've, I've delivered these unto you. Keep those because I delivered them to you. You know, he's, he's the, he was the leader. Verse uh, number 3 of 1 Corinthians 11. You're in Philippians chapter 3. He says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. He's still saying, even though he's a leader, and he's, you know, that, that they need to listen to him, he's saying, well, the head of every man is Christ. You know, God is, at the, is, is in charge. So even though he's a leader, obviously he's not the final authority. Christ is. God is. Um, Philippians chapter 3, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. He's saying, be, you know, follow, follow me, and also look at all of them that walk the way that he's doing it, so you have us for an example. He's saying, excuse me, look to us as being your example. Verse number 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. When you got someone who you know, they're preaching the right gospel, 
you can see the works that they're doing with their life. That's a good leader to follow. You can, it lines up with what the scripture is saying. And one of the reasons why it's important then to say, you know what, I'm going to follow this person, listen to what they have to say, because it, we, as we saw in Ephesians 4, the, one of the reasons why God gave us pastors and teachers is because there's people out there lying in wait to deceive. He says here, he says, because there's many people out there. I've told you about them often. He says, even now weeping. He says, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm saddened because they're out there and they exist. And I care about you so much. I don't want you to get deceived. I don't want you to get tricked by these people because they're trying to trick you. He says, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Follow me. I won't lead you down that path. You, you'll learn the truth. You'll learn the right ways of God and you won't be following, um, get caught up in these other people whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame. Very important. And I know I already said this, but you know, Paul's preaching under the, under the authority of the Holy Spirit and he's telling people to follow him. And this is what I you know, like to show everybody who's saying, well, I don't go to church because I don't need some man to tell me. Apparently they do because they haven't gotten to this understanding of all these passages that say to follow, you know, to follow a man. But not only that, turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 10. Because these people seem to be ignoring the part of the Bible that actually commands not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Because it's not just about, the church is not just about the pastor. That's not it. The church is a congregation, it's a group of people. The, the, the pastor is one element of the church. Yes, it's important to get the teaching and the training and learning in this sense. But there's a lot more to the church even than just that. And the Bible commands us that we need to be in church, especially in the New Testament. We're going to read here. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10. We're going to see why church is important. And, you know, I'm sure you probably heard me hit on this before, but I'm going to keep hitting on it again because even though you're in church right now, there might come a day where you might think that church isn't that big of a deal. It's not that important. I've already learned this stuff. We need to get this clear in our minds and keep it fresh that no, church is important because the Bible says so. Because Hebrews chapter 10 specifically says that's how important it is. Look at verse number 23 of Hebrews 10. The Bible says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So if one, we need to be strong in our faith. We don't want to be shaken and moved and, and being tossed about. We need to be strong in our, in our profession of faith without wavering. Verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So one of the reasons to come together church is because we are helping each other. When you talk to each other just, you know, about how you're doing, what's going on. Hey, I gave the gospel to my friend and they just got saved. Hey, praise the Lord. That's benefit to both people as part of that conversation. It's, that, that's, it's inspiring. It, it, it's edifying. It helps us to be a part of that. Or, oh man, I just had this really rough week. You know, nothing seems to be working out. Hey, you could have people there to help you out with that and, and, to, and to, to, you know, cheer you up and to bring you, you know, maybe give you some good scriptures and say, yeah, you know what? All that stuff is going to pass away. You know, maybe, maybe your job, you know, you got fired. Oh man, I got fired. Yeah, but you know, the riches of this world are going to be, you know, they're all, all going to be burned up. God already promised you're not going to be begging bread. He'll take care of you, you know, keep your faith. And, and that's the type of encouragement that we need at church. There's all different, I mean, so many different reasons why this is important. We're in this together. We're a family. We need, to, we need to be able to be there for each other. This is a huge importance for, for why we come to church. Look at verse number 25. Because here's where he's going to tie it together. He says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Now, I want to say real quickly, you know, he says not forsaking the assembling. That means like you're not going to church, right? We hold church services three times a week. So I'm not saying you have to be here for every single service, every single time, or else you're forsaking the assembly. I don't believe that, okay? Um, 
obviously it's your choice. There's no mandatory. The Bible doesn't say you have to go to church three times a week. It doesn't say how often you have to go to church. And, and take note of that too, because it doesn't say how often you have to go. God's not putting that standard and saying, here's where the bar is. One of the reasons why I think God doesn't do that in many cases, it's not just in this case, is because a lot of times people want to just barely meet that minimum. You know what I mean? You say, oh, well, this is, this is what God expects me. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And you kind of stop there because you say, I'm good with God now. He doesn't give us that, 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 that level, right? He doesn't, he doesn't tell us that's exactly where it is. Because I think he wants you to figure that. I think he wants you to try to think, what's going to make God happy? What does God want? And if we keep finishing off this verse, let's see what the rest of the verse is. Verse 25. I'll start from the beginning. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people forsake the church. But exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So what in context, what is he talking about? The day approaching? He's talking about the day of Christ. He's talking about when Jesus Christ is coming back. As we see the signs, as we see things start to come to pass, that day is approaching. He says, so much the more you need to be with the assembling. It's that much more important. And this is one of the reasons why we do have three services a week, because it is important. It's very important. Now, does anyone here have any doubts that the day seems to be approaching very quickly? Because I don't. I mean, it, the signs are all around us. The world is becoming much more wicked. We're starting to see, the Bible says, as the days of, of Noe and as in the days of Lot, like as the days were in Sodom and Gomorrah, and as the day, you know, right before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, right before God dis destroyed um, the, the earth with, in Noah's days, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. say, that's the same way it's going to be. And things are getting pretty bad. And we see lots of other things. You could, you know, just technologically, we see how the world's becoming real small and there's a lot more control, a control grid being put into place to be able to enact, um, you know, people not being able to buy and sell and all this other stuff. It's, it's getting pretty obvious how, how that can actually be implemented. Like, I mean, just realistically speaking, we can see that these things can happen. We can see the day approaching. It's upon us. Now, doesn't this verse say that we need more church as that day approaches? We need to be in here more. We need to be gathering together more. We need to be edifying each other more. We need to be learning more. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. Now, don't miss out um, on what's being offered here either at this church because I love everyone that comes to this church quite a bit. And I work very hard to equip you as a Christian to follow Christ and to withstand the evil that's bound to come your way as a result of following him. When you start to follow Christ, the devil's going to come and attack you because he doesn't want you following Christ. He'd rather just have you doing nothing and saying nothing to people. But when you actually do start to do things, he will attack you. I am working hard to combat that. I want you to be ready to withstand it. I want you to have the knowledge. I want you to have the strength to be able to, 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 to stand up against that and to face that. The things that are being taught here are very important. You know, our church is very social and we should have friendship here. We should, we should have great fellowship, which we do. You know, I, I think we're all in you. I mean, we're, we're very small right now, but we, we've got great fellowship and unity. And, and I know everybody's thinking about each other and praying for each other. And that's great. And I, and I love that. And I'm not going to downplay that at all. But there is more than just that, especially what this verse is talking about. Because it's all important. The teaching's important. The fellowship's important. The, you know, the, the unity's important. Everything is important. And we need this so much the more as we see the day approaching. And I hope that, you know, attending church is a priority for you because of how important this is. Because, because there's a lot at stake. I mean, just spiritually speaking. We want to make sure we are as ready as possible. Now, I remember when I finally got right with God. I got saved when I was 20, but I was not right with God. I was living a life that, that I shouldn't have been living. I was in a lot of sin. I just didn't really 
you know, every once in a while I'd dust off my Bible and maybe read a page or something, and, and that was it, okay? Doing lots of things that were wrong. But once I finally got plugged into a good church, and actually, because I had gone to multiple churches in the, in the time frame before I got plugged into a good one, I've been to many of them, but didn't really seem to stick for some reason. Didn't really seem to learn a lot. Didn't really seem to grow. Didn't really, you know, I, I, and, and, you know, I, a lot of it is my fault for not sticking it out longer at some places. And, and, and you know, I definitely should have been obeying the scripture of not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together because these people are saved. But when I got into a church where I can see a great leader, somebody who lived and breathed what he believed and what he preached, my old pastor, he's, I mean, I could see that he was different. I can see this guy believes the Bible because he's not just talking about it. He's doing it. And that example, yes, look, God worked in my heart. God worked in my life. I believe God led me to that church. But I needed that man to be an example for a real life example for me to see because I was a baby, a baby in Christ. I didn't know any better. I needed someone to help guide me. I didn't even have enough character to be able to, to take the Bible and read it on my own and just learn everything on my own. Look, I was a baby. I needed help. I needed someone to, to show me the way and to guide me a little bit. Now, I would used my discernment. I had the Holy Spirit, right, telling me, helping me along a little bit, and, and I could watch and say, okay, is, is what he's doing right? And I could still go back and read and read for myself, and that's what I did do. But without having someone like that, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And it was very shortly after, I, rem I remember vividly when I first started going to church, within just a few weeks, man, I was like a sponge. I started downloading all this preaching and I'm listening to this, I'm reading the Bible, I'm doing, you know, like, like, like as much as I, I, it's exciting. It's exciting. When you start hearing the truth, like, man, this is great because God's word is awesome. And when you got someone just preaching it and, and teaching it and living it and like, man, you're really doing this stuff. You're actually getting people saved from hell. I mean, you're doing this great work. I want to be a part of that. And I want to know as much as I could possibly know. And that's what helped me out a lot. And that's what I'm hopefully I can do the same for you. I want you to get excited for serving God. I want you to get to that point where you say, you know what? Man, I want to be in church. I want to be here. I want to hear the preaching. I want to, I want to learn as much as I can. Because honestly, you know, I, I put a lot of work into my sermons and I preach three times a week. And not any one of them do I just say, eh, whatever. Oh, yeah. oh I got to I gotta make another sermon. Okay, well, I'll just do something easy and that's it and, you know, whatever. No, there's a lot of time and effort goes into this. I am investing, not just for myself, but for you. I am doing the research and studying out a lot of topics to try to explain this and to the best of my ability be able to teach it so that you can learn and, and grow from what I'm doing in the work. If we were all doing the same amount of work all the time, that's a lot of work being done. And at different levels of our Christianity, not everyone's even capable of doing that and putting all the pieces together. I'm trying to do that for you. So all, all I'm saying is, you know, look, I'm not saying you're not right with God. That's why I started off saying that if you don't come to all the services or whatever, I'm just stressing the importance of church because we need it so much the more as the day approaches. And, and you know, whenever you can, I, I think you would be benefited by being in and being a part of the group as much as possible. And I think that's what the Bible's teaching is that we do need this so much the more. We need all of it. We need the teaching. We need the fellowship. We need the whole nine. We need it all. Turn, if you would, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. I might have to skip the, the last part of my sermon here, but we've either got this is either the last place we'll turn to or one more. It depends on how long I can hold out here. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Mm. 
2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. If you're in Hebrews, if you're looking for it, it's before the book of Hebrews, so it's going to be left in the Bible from where you're at. And we're going to start reading in verse number 6 of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. If you're going backwards from Hebrews, you, it's right before the books of... Um, it's, it will be, if you're going backwards, it's going to be right after the books of 2 Timothy and 1 Timothy, then 2 Thessalonians going, going in reverse order. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. And again, you're learning from people. They're learning traditions. And people like to say, oh, traditions are always bad. No, traditions are not always bad. If it's a good tradition, like, hey, we have a tradition of going out soul winning every week at Sundays at 2 o'clock. You know, that's a good tradition to have. Right. Nothing wrong with that. But, um, and he's, that's what he's even saying, look, not after, the, you know, withdraw yourself from these other people who are out sinning and not after the tradition that you've learned from us. Verse number 7. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought, that means he worked, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. So what he's saying is, when they came and they were evangelizing and they were preaching the gospel, it would have been just fine for them to receive money at their hands because they're doing all this work for God. People doing God's work and doing the work of the ministry is nothing wrong with them being supported by the church, by the brethren, by other people because they're dedicating their lives to serving God. There's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely just fine. But he's saying that even though they did have that power, he says, we wrought, we worked, we worked anyways. We could have taken money from you. We could have been supported by you, but we didn't. Why did we not do it? Because we wanted to be examples. We wanted to show you that we aren't just collecting a, a cushy paycheck and, you know, that this job's so easy. We're working hard, and we're showing you you can do this too. If we can work and do this, why can't you? And that's a good example to show. That's a good example to live. He says, but to make ourselves an, an example unto you to follow us. He's saying, do like we're doing. We're being a good example unto you. Verse number 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And it makes me think that maybe there's a problem with people being lazy. Because he made this rule. He said, look, if you're not willing to work, then you shouldn't eat. And would to God America could wake up to this truth. Instead of just saying, oh, you don't want to work? Well, the government will just pay you a paycheck every week. And people saying, oh, I can't find a job. You're not looking hard enough. There are jobs to be, I don't care where you're at or what you're doing. There are jobs to be had. If you apply yourself and you get off your rear end and get out there and start looking for work, you say, oh, well, I don't want to do that job. There's your problem. It's not that there's no work. It's that you're not willing to do the work. That's the problem. Work is available. And they even said, hey, if you're not going to work, then you're not going to eat. So see how long you don't want to work for. Because <laughs> when you start getting hungry, you're going to be willing to work. You say, you know what, no one's going to give me anything. Okay, well, I'll go do it myself. And if we can just remove this, this government handout on all this welfare and everything and just, just paying people to sit around and do nothing, because you know that's what's happening. There's pe I mean, people, I've heard so many, st countless stories of people that are, Saying, oh, well, my unemployment's going to be running out in, in a few weeks, so now I need to go look for a job and get serious about it because they know, well, this is how long I have. This is how long the government's going to pay me to do nothing. Now, all of a sudden, I have to go out and look for a job. And that's what happens, and that's what people do, and they just take advantage of the system because it's not godly. People need to be able to work for themselves. Abigail, are you okay? Are you okay? Do you feel sick? Okay. But let's
let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. We ought to not get, let, let our work get us weary. You know, if you're doing well, keep it up. You know, it gets hard at times. It gets difficult. But, um, but, but stick with it. So my challenge to you then is we see these examples of people following the Apostle Paul and, and trying to be you know, followers of them. How are you as an example to other people? If someone were to watch how you live your life and maybe copy the things that you do, would that be a good example for Christ? How many souls would that person end up being able to, to lead to Christ and get converted or be able to, to teach the Bible or whatever? Um, how much good would they actively be doing? And just, just put yourself in that position. Say, let's just say people were looking at me and following me and just doing everything that I'm doing. In that situation, would you say that person's doing a lot for Christ? A little bit? Somewhat? Think about that for yourself. And, and see where you need to be at in your life. Because um, we want to stay active. We want to be not just keeping ourselves from sin, but doing more. And the most obvious thing, that's why I bring it up over and over again, is winning souls of Christ. Because that, that is the most important thing. And, and that is essentially what it's all about. Our own knowledge, our own teaching. Yes, we need to, to grow and get to a point so that we can bring others with us. It's the love of others and it's the love of God. Hey, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The point of Jesus coming and dying on the cross for us, the whole point of him coming and doing all that was so that we can go to heaven. The whole point of us after we're saved is to go out and bring more people with us. Like that is what it's all about. Now, in order to be effective, in order to do that, we need to be in church, we need to be studying, we need to grow, we need to learn, we need to you know, get sin out of our life, we need to do all this stuff, and we'll be better instruments for God to use to go out and reach more people. It's a simple plan. It's not complicated. God didn't make this extremely complicated. I didn't say it's easy. It may be difficult, but it's, it's not complicated. The end result is the same. We need to try to make sure that we can be good examples. Because so, when someone sees a good example, that speaks volumes. You have so much more credibility with someone. If you want someone to believe you, and this is why when I was out of church and, not, and living a bad lifestyle, I didn't even want to speak about Christ. Because I was a hypocrite. Because I didn't want people to look at me and say, how can you say that you believe the Bible when I know that you're doing all of these things? And it makes you shut your mouth. And it did for me. I didn't want to say anything. I was afraid to open up my mouth. Even when I had opportunities. I had a friend tell me, yeah, I'm thinking about getting into Mormon church. I'm thinking about doing all this stuff. I was just like, no, man, don't do that. But I couldn't really say much more than that. Because of my own sin. Because I was a poor example. Why should he listen to me? And it's a shame. It's a shame to be in that position. And, and I'm never going to allow myself to be in that position again. Because this is so important. This isn't something I made up. It's the truth. It's God's word. It's our salvation. But I don't want people to look at me and say, why should I believe you? I'm going to the, live the best example I can. For one, I believe it. It's, it's true. It's important. And I even got to the point of doubting my own salvation because I say, if I believe this stuff, why am I doing this? Because it doesn't make any sense. I, I would even question myself. Why am I doing these things? Now, I know I was still saved. I had the Holy Ghost. I, lived in, I was born again. I knew it. I, know, I, I knew I was saved. Because I was. Because I put my faith in Christ. Because that's all I had to do. But going down that road, going down that path, you know, it just leads to more problems. You're not going to be able to, to be effective. You're not going to be able to get people saved. And you'll even end up doubting yourself and doubting your own salvation. And, um, you know, we need to find... And I didn't have a good leader to follow at that time. And I should have. 
So, <clears throat> let's turn real quick. I'm going to wrap this up. I, I, this is my last place. First Peter, chapter number five. It's right near the end of the New Testament. First Peter, chapter five. So, if you're going backwards all the way from the end, you have Revelation, and then Jude, Third John, Second John, First John. And then you get into the epistles of Peter. So you have 2 Peter and 1 Peter. Real close to the end of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter number 5. So again, what I'm trying to do is just challenge you. It's important to understand there's nothing wrong with following a man as long as they're following Christ. You know, as human beings, we need someone to take the lead and to help guide us and show us the way. Um, a leader can really help to get a lot of accomplished. Now, um, you know, someone that's able to direct the efforts of an entire group, you're going to be able to accomplish a lot more. Where you have, hey, we all want to do the same thing. We all have the same goal. Well, hey, there's a leader that they could kind of just wrap up everything, get everyone in unison, get everyone together. And that's part of the pastor's job. That's one of the things that I'm supposed to do is, hey, we're all believers in Christ. We all want to serve God. We all want to do good. Well, the pastor's here to kind of bring everyone together and say, okay, here's the direction. Here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. You know, here's our marching orders. The only time you don't want to follow pastors is obviously if he's not following Christ. But he ought to be a living example to the flock. Now, one thing I want to point out, which is important to see from 1 Peter chapter 5, and, um, you know, hopefully I never get into this, but I'll, I'll, again, um, I, I won't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be this type of a pastor. I won't ever be. But um, if you do ever end up going to another church, you know, this, it's not right for the pastor to lord over your life. And you won't find that here. Now, I'll preach on sin quite a bit. I'll preach on church attendance. I'll preach on all the things that I think are important, all the things I think you should and shouldn't be doing in your life based on what the Bible says. But you don't have to, like, come to me for approval in your life or, you know, that's not my job. I'm not here to say, I see you doing this and that and micromanaging your life. Okay, I'm going to preach the Bible and it's up to you to decide what you do with that. So I'm not going to be looking over your shoulder and sneak, you know, checking out your house and being like, okay, what, what kind of thing, what kind of sin are you into? What, you know, it's not like that. There are some pastors out there that are like that. It does exist. But um, let's start reading verse number one of 1 Peter chapter number five. The Bible says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. This is why we see Peter was a pastor because he says he's an elder. An elder and pastor are the same thing. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. And he's speaking this to the, to the pastors, right? To the elders. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre's sake, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall re receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So he's admonishing the pastors here, saying, look, you need to feed the flock. You need to keep them well fed. Give them the truth. Give them the word. But you're not a lord over them. Right? Just like as a husband, I'm in charge of the family. But I am the, in charge over my family and my wife. I'm not in charge over your wife or anyone else's wife for that matter, right? It's, it's our own structure. So in church, yes, I'm, I'm, an, I'm to be an example to the flock, but I don't lord over you and say, these are our rules. And that's why we don't, you know, some churches even go as far as they have like rules and you have to sign a contract and something that says, well, I won't do this and I won't do that. Look, that's lording over people. We're not going to lord over you. We are going to preach the truth. I'm going to preach everything I see in this Bible that, that, that needs to be preached, which is, that, which is the whole book. And I, and I won't make excuse for it, and I won't back down for it, and some of it might be kind of hard to swallow, but it is what it is. But I'm also not going to be lording over you and, and telling you what to do. Um, verse number 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And, you know, it takes a level of humility to be able to follow an, a leader, to follow somebody else. 
to say, okay, I'm going to learn from you. In order to learn anything from anyone, you have to be humble. You have to be willing to say, I don't know everything. I'm going to learn what I can from you. And even the pastor ought to be humble, too. We all, it's an attribute everybody ought to have. Because I don't know it all. I know what I know. I know enough to be in the position I'm at. But to, to be arrogant enough to say, well, I know everything in the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's funny when we talk to people at the door, they say, I, I read the Bible once. I know what's in it. You know it all? Huh, that's pretty good because <laughs> I've been reading the Bible quite a bit and, and, and I would never dare to make a claim like that. And, and we shouldn't. And, and, and that's pride. We need to be humble. We need to be, have the humility to be able to learn and to grow and to learn from other people and to take that type of instruction. And why is this all important? Look at verse number seven. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The devil is like a roaring lion. Imagine a roaring lion going up and down the street that's just looking for food. You probably wouldn't want to be stepping out of your front door. <laughs> you see a roaring lion walking down the street, but that's what Satan is like. But we don't need to just avoid Satan because we can't. We don't know where he is. But we need to be able to resist him. And that is going to come through knowledge, which is going to help build your faith, being edified by congregating together with other like-minded believers. All of these things will help to strengthen you so that you don't get devoured because the devil will chew you up and spit you out if you're not founded in the word, if you are not solid, if you are not unmovable because he's going to come and bring all kinds of things against you. And this is what we're here for is to help defend against that. There's a spiritual warfare going on. It's a spiritual, it's not a physical battle. We're not going to see it with our eyes. We're not going to be getting into fist fights with people, right? We're not supposed to be brawlers. It's a spiritual battle, though. One you can't see. One that you have to have enough faith and understanding just to know that it exists. The devil's real. And he's, and he's out to get you, especially if you're trying to do work for Christ. We need to be ready for that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for the institution of church, dear God. We thank you that that you've, you've given us pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets and all these people, dear Lord, to, to do the work of the ministry, to, to help people out, to, to help us all to get through the, the sometimes the very rough attacks that we have that are going on spiritually in our lives, dear Lord. We thank you for the support system that we have. We thank you ultimately for our salvation. God, help us to love other people enough to want to be proactive, to do the work, to, to not just be content um, um, with us being saved, but to be willing to take that knowledge of salvation out and, and to, to work at it and to get better at being able to, to explain just the, the great truths of the Bible and, and the truths of the free gift that you've given to us, dear Lord, and help us to be able to get other people saved, dear Lord. And God, last thing I want to thank you for keeping me strengthened enough to be able to um, preach this morning, Lord. We all love you. We thank you for the, for the great unity we have here together. I pray that you would please build our church and help us to continue to grow and in faith and in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.